This is a summary of the judgment of the court in what I may refer to as the no confidence motion case. Article 106.6 of the Guyana Constitution states that the cabinet, including the president, is required to resign if the government is defeated by the majority vote of all the elected members of the National Assembly on a vote of confidence. Article 106.7 further mandates that an election be held within three months of the vote or within such longer period as determined by two thirds of all elected members of the assembly. On the 21st December 2018, the leader of the opposition moved a motion of no confidence in the government. All 65 members of the assembly were present and they all voted. Mr. Sharandas Prasad, a government member, joined the 32 opposition members in voting for the motion so that 33 members ultimately voted in favor of the motion and 32 voted against. Despite this, the government did not resign and no resolution was passed to prolong its continuance in office. Instead, litigation ensued. Mr. Compton Reed, a private citizen, sought a declaration that Mr. Passard's vote on the no confidence motion was invalid because Mr. Passard held dual citizenship at the time of his election to the assembly in 2015, contrary to Article 155 of the Constitution. The Attorney General contended that the formula for achieving a majority of all elected members of the assembly for the purpose of Article 106.6 was at least one half of the members plus one. Utilizing this formula, he argued that 34 votes were required to pass the motion. Another private citizen, Mr. Christopher Ram, sought declarations that the motion had been properly passed by the 33 votes cast in the assembly and that national and regional elections were required to be held no later than 21st March 2019 in accordance with Article 106.7. Chief Justice Roxanne George found that a majority of all 65 members of the assembly was 33 votes, as the formula required by Article 1066 was simply one above the maximum number of potential opposers. She therefore held that the motion of no confidence had been validly passed. She further held that she had no jurisdiction to entertain the claim that Mr. Prasad's appointment was contrary to Article 155 as any challenge to his appointment had to be made within 28 days of his election to the assembly in accordance with the National Assembly Validity of Elections Act. Regardless, she held that Mr. Prasad's disqualification would not have invalidated his vote on the December 21st motion, as Article 165.2 of the Constitution preserved the validity of his participation in the assembly's proceedings. The Court of Appeal unanimously upheld the Chief Justice's decision that the claim against Mr. Prasad's election could not be entertained and that his vote could not be invalidated. A majority, however, agreed with the Attorney General's half plus one formula and found that the motion required 34 votes in order validly to be passed. Both findings of the Court of Appeal were appealed to this court. It was argued on behalf of the Attorney General, Mr. Reed and Mr. Joseph Hammond, all together, all lumped together and referred to as the respondents, that Article 106.6 did not apply to motions of no confidence. They highlighted the fact that the article in the Constitution used the phrase, and I quote, on a vote of confidence, unquote. And they submitted that there was a fundamental difference between a motion of confidence an emotion of no confidence. In particular, it was argued that only a member of the government could move motions of confidence and that the article, that's Article 106, that article's requirement for the government to resign and for elections to be held did not apply to motions of no confidence. The court rejected these submissions. The court held that Article 106 gave effect to the fundamental principle of responsible or accountable government, 
a principle that required the government to resign when it no longer enjoyed the confidence of Parliament. Whether Article 1066 used the term, quote, a motion of confidence, unquote, or, quote, a motion of no confidence, unquote, was unimportant, as these were mere linguistic differences denoting different sides of the same coin. There was nothing in Article 106 that prevented any member of the opposition from moving a motion of no confidence. Article 1066 also did not hinge on the provisions of the anti-defection regime set out at Article 156. That regime was separate and distinct from the concept of responsible government and merely sought to prevent a member of the National Assembly from crossing the floor or having been elected on a particular list from disassociating himself or herself from that list and continuing in Parliament as an independent member. The court then went on to consider the majority needed to pass a motion of no confidence. The court decided that the requirement for a majority of all the elected members of the National Assembly referred to a majority of the total number of votes or seats in the Assembly, irrespective of the number of members who actually vote. In determining that majority, the court was of the opinion that the half plus one rule was not applicable. The court held that since the assembly comprised an odd number of persons, that is 65, when all the members of the assembly are present and vote, all that is necessary is to determine whether the motion has garnered, quote, a majority of all the elected members, unquote. Such a majority in the court's view was clearly at least 33 votes. The court then turned its focus to the issue of whether it had jurisdiction at this time to inquire into the issue of Mr. Prasad's disqualification from being a member of the National Assembly. The court found that historically, disputes over the qualification of members to legislative assemblies were not triable by the courts, but were instead determined in the assemblies themselves. However, such matters eventually became entrusted to the courts. Saunders, Justice Saunders pointed out that Article 163.1 has now vested in the High Court an exclusive jurisdiction to determine any question regarding the qualification of any person to be elected as a member of the National Assembly. The courts must exercise that jurisdiction within a particular framework established by the Constitution itself. Article 163.4 authorizes Parliament to make provision with respect to the circumstances and manner in which, and the conditions upon which, proceedings for the determination of any question arising under Article 163 may be instituted in the High Court. Parliament may also provide the consequences of the determination of any such question. The Constitution specifies that it was for Parliament and not the courts to lay down the practice and procedure in relation to the court's jurisdiction and powers in this regard. Although the Constitution gave the courts the exclusive jurisdiction to determine questions of the qualification of members of the National Assembly, the courts exercised that jurisdiction strictly in keeping with the provisions of Acts of Parliament. The relevant act in these circumstances was the National Assembly Validity of Elections Act, which required that a petition alleging that Mr. Prasad was disqualified from running for office be presented within 28 days after the results of the 2015 elections out of which the matter arose was published in the Gazette. The court emphasized that it had long been recognized that this election petition procedure was intended to be an exclusive one. The court held by a majority that the court had no jurisdiction to consider the question of the validity of a member's election to the assembly by any other means. The majority emphasized that the court had no inherent jurisdiction to exercise in order to address the issue of disqualification of a member. The 28 day period having expired, the court therefore lacked jurisdiction to assess whether Mr. Prasad was disqualified at the time of his election. The court also held that there was no need to consider whether Mr. Prasad's seat ought to be declared vacant in accordance with Article 156.1d of the Constitution, because one, Article 156.1d applied to supervening events that caused a person to become disqualified 
well, he or she was a member of, a, of the assembly. And Mr. Prasad's disqualification clearly arose before he became a member. And two, Mr. Prasad had already been recalled and removed from the National Assembly on the 3rd of January 2019, the very day before these proceedings were initiated in the High Court. Having concluded that the court lacked jurisdiction to impeach Mr. Prasad's election, the court found that there was no real need to ascertain whether Article 165.2 preserved the validity of Mr. Prasad's vote on the motion. However, even if the court had jurisdiction to declare Mr. Prasad's election to the Assembly to be void from the outset, the court agreed with the courts below that Article 165.2 would have preserved the validity of his vote. Finally, the court rejected the submission that Mr. Prasad was absolutely required to vote against the motion of no confidence along with other members of the government list unless the party's whip granted permission for a so-called conscience vote. The court found that nothing in Article 156.3 or anywhere else in the Constitution prohibited Mr. Prasad from voting against the government on any particular measure. Such a vote may well cause the representative of his list to remove him from the assembly, but his vote would still be valid. Having regard to all the findings above, the court held that the National Assembly properly passed a motion of no confidence in the government on the 21st December 2019, and that the provisions of Article 106, 6, and 7 were accordingly tri triggered. In a separate concurring judgment, Justice Witt concurred fully with the judgment of the court. In relation to the meaning of the term, a vote of confidence, he found that it was obvious from the legislative history of Article 1066 that the amendments to the Constitution in 2000, by which this vote of confidence procedure was reintroduced into Guyana, sought to bring Guyana back from an authoritarian presidential regime to a more democratic one. It was within this framework that the provision ought to be interpreted. The restrictive approach suggested by the respondents as to the scope of Article 106 is also not consistent with the fundamental freedoms of conscience, expression, assembly, and association, in particular, the freedom to form or belong to political parties. A constitutional provision that sought to take away or limit these rights from members of the National Assembly especially with respect to voting and supporting or not supporting the government, would need to be very clear and unambiguous for it to take effect. While acknowledging that Guyana had a hybrid legal system, Justice Smith was also not convinced that that system warranted the approach suggested by the respondents when compared to countries such as the United States, South Africa, the Netherlands, Suriname, Curaçao, or France. In relation to Mr. Prasad's dual citizenship, Justice Swift found that the constitutional disqualification in Article 155 was not absolute, but one of limited scope. Moreover, statutes of limitation were well-known legal devices. Where there was a late discovery of a member's dual citizenship and the member refuses to vacate his seat, no legal consequences will ensue unless and until someone properly petitions the High Court in accordance with Section 43 of the National Assembly Validity of Elections Act to have the court declare that seat vacant. Justice Witt agreed that this situation did not occur in this case. Lastly, Justice Witt considered the reasons why the anti-defection and recall procedures in Article 156.3 were introduced. He found that none of the three grounds mentioned in the article had anything to do with voting in the National Assembly and that the whole idea of the provision was to prevent members belonging to a list from, quote, stealing, unquote, their seats from their party. The possibility of recall may help to discourage, although not to prevent, members from voting against the list. But this was not the main reason for the provision. Justice Anderson, in a concurring judgment, also agreed with the other members of the court that Article 106, 6, and 7 had been triggered. However, he noted that there may be merit in the consideration by those responsible for proposing constitutional amendments of the wording of Article 1066, as he was far from sanguine that the Constitution was unambiguous on the issue of motions of no confidence. He expressed sympathy with the respondent's submission 
that the manifest purpose of the anti-defection provisions in Article 156.3 was to prevent a member from voting against his or her list so as to ensure continuity and stability in the government. Application of Article 156.3 in this way did not necessarily render Articles 1066 and 1067 redundant, nor did it make parliamentary debates sterile or farcical. Nevertheless, Mr. Sanderson, drawing attention to the report of the Constitution Reform Commission to the National Assembly, which anticipated defeat and resignation of the government on a vote of confidence, and noting the fact that nothing in the Constitution prevented the leader of the opposition from moving such a motion, he concluded that motions of no confidence were allowed. He said that the court could not be expected to fashion the fundamental constitutional principles argued for by the respondents, which would affect fixed parliamentary terms from the mere imputations attributable to Articles 1066 and 156.3. Mr. Sanderson was also of the view that the passage of the 28-day period specified in the National Assembly Validity of Elections Act will not always render the contested election unassailable. Such an inflexible rule, in his opinion, could lead to absurd and preposterous results. He considered that the circumstances in which a court was entitled to disregard the procedures and timelines specified in the election legislation in favor of upholding the fundamental tenets of the Constitution regarding eligibility to sit in Parliament were not entirely clear and required further thought. But he was of the opinion that one circumstance where this extraordinary jurisdiction may be warranted is where parliamentary membership was obtained by intentional and fraudulent means, as it would be an unacceptable affront to the Constitution to give its protection to a person who knowingly and fraudulently embezzled his or her way into Parliament, knowing full well that he or she was not qualified to sit as a parliamentarian. In the present proceedings, he did not find any clear allegations made or proof provided that Mr. Prasad knowingly and fraudulently deceived the people of Guyana and the Parliament in his election to the National Assembly. Accordingly, he agreed that the failure to challenge Mr. Prasad's eligibility to sit within the time specified in the election legislation rendered the challenge unsustainable. In another concurring judgment, Justice Rajnath Lee also expressed her agreement with the President's judgment. She, however, added some remarks on the system of proportional representation that existed in Guyana and the impact, if any, that that system had on the issue of whether Mr. Prasad's vote violated Article 156.3 of the Constitution. In her view, the key question that arose was whether, not having declared in writing in advance that he did not support the list from which his name was extracted, Mr. Prasad could validly vote on a no-confidence motion against that list. In other words, whether it was the intention of the framers of the Constitution that such a vote as that of Mr. Prasad's on the 21st December 2018 should be disqualified. Mr. Rajnathi found that there was nothing in Article 156.3 or in any provision of the Constitution that led to the conclusion that the framers of the Constitution had such an intention. In her view, there would have to be an express provision in the Constitution that any vote by a member against the list from which his name was extracted was disqualified. The argument that it was implicit from the provisions of Article 156.3 and from the system of proportional representation that the framers intended this effect could not, in her view, be sustained. Such a drastic con consequence would have required an express provision within the Constitution itself. The member who voted against his list no doubt risked paying the ultimate political price and could be recalled in accordance with the provisions of the Constitution. Justice Rajdanli therefore found that there was nothing which prevented Mr. Prasad from voting in favor of the No Confidence Motion. She agreed that the National Assembly validly passed the motion of no confidence and that the provisions of Article 106, 6, and 7 of the Constitution had been triggered. She urged all to bear in mind as the court awaited further submissions that the rule of law was an important guiding constitutional principle of a sovereign democratic state like Ghana. That was a summary of the opinions of the judgment of the court and the respective opinions that 
were given. Copies of the judgment would be delivered to the parties and the two judgments would be placed on the court's website during the course of this morning. Now, we had said during the hearing that we would afford counsel an opportunity to address the court on, in particular, the consequential orders that the court should make in relation to the conclusion of the court on the Zulfika matter. We proposed that we have we proposed that we that between now and the twenty fourth the parties engage with each other and that on the twenty fourth we will hear submissions uh, from the parties, or we would hear from the parties um, on that issue of the consequential relief. I'm just being reminded to specifically indicate that the reading of the summaries is not intended to be a substitute for the reasoning of the court. The official reasoning of the court is to be found course in the formal judgment and that the summaries that I read are simply a, an attempt um, informally to summarize what is contained in the judgments and those summaries or anything that I said in reading those summaries should not be taken uh, or used in any consideration of the court's reasons. So counsel I need to know about your availability on June the 24th. I'm further reminded to, to point out that, well, and it would have been made clear, I believe, um, that Justice Rajnath Lee um, fully, uh, well, she wrote a, an opinion in each of the cases but that Justice Witt, who is not here with us, Justice Hayton, sorry, who is not here with us, um, fully concurs in the uh, majority judgments which were delivered and has signed, signed those judgments. So I need to know about the availability of counsel on the 24th of June for us to discuss the consequential orders in each of the two matters uh, in which judgment was given. Available. Available, Your Honor, Sanjeev Daston. Yes. It is convenient, Well, let's ask this question. Is it inconvenient to any party? <laughs> Good. So on the 25th. <laughs> yes, Mr. It is embarrassing to me, um, Your Honor, in that I'm committed to the Court of Appeal in Trinidad and Tobago, but I shall try to make some arrangement. I would really appreciate that, sir. Um, so, we will... Yeah. Yes. I came on coordinate for the Attorney General of Health. So far as the date is concerned, um, we will make ourselves available. I have one question for the court. Guidance. Is it that the court wishes to make a correction without any further evidence with respect to the consequence of the court's decision? And I'm speaking specifically with respect to the position of the TCOM. The court did not propose to hear any further evidence. The court no, said. The court simply wished to hear from you whether there was any agreement among yourselves on whether on, on, on the orders that should be made by the court. The findings of the court are final, the determinative, and it's simply a question now of um, 
consequential orders. And if between now and the 24th there is no concurrence on that issue, um, then we would have to find a way where, in fact, we had, I didn't want to go there because I'm hoping that on the 24th you will come back and tell us that all sides have agreed on these consequences that will follow and the court will order accordingly. Um, so let's just stick to that point at, the, at this point in time. But you would see in the judgments of the court that um, there are clear findings made. The Constitution sets out, in some cases, consequences that must follow. And um, in the case in particular of the Ghana Elections Commission chairperson, um, we would like to hear from you in particular in relation to that one um, on what formal orders um, you might agree on, if you can agree, the court should make, um, and we'll take it from there. Your Honor, can I make one suggestion with respect to the no conference motion cases? And that is that the, for want of a better word, the appellants propose or put up the draft of what the consequential order should look like for review by the respondents, so that we, rather than us, both sides putting up orders. Well, we, we wanted to, to take ourselves out of that process, so we encourage you to engage with each other. And on the 24th, That's it. That's it. if you can present us with some consensus, then if we find that that consensus is something that we can lend our imprimatur to, then we would be happy to do so. So that I didn't see it as a process of somebody putting up an order which is going to be shared with the court and there will be back and forth involved in the court. Uh, that, that's something between now and the 24th, which the parties can and should do among themselves. We are hoping for a happy marriage between principle and practicality. <laughs> so, in the absence of anything further, um, well, there's also the question which has not been addressed at all of um, costs. Lord. And um, that also can be discussed um, on the 24th. And perhaps even before, you, that can be an issue which both sides can talk among themselves in relation to as well. So the court will adjourn until the 24th at... Actually, on the 24th, we have a case in the morning, so we had scheduled this for the afternoon. So this would be 2 o'clock or 2.30? 2 o'clock. At 2 o'clock, we would set this matter down for hearing on the 24th at 2 o'clock Eastern Caribbean time, which I believe is 12 o'clock if you remain in Belize, Mr. Courtney. 2 o'clock. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Yes.